you want to grow your butt, you're going to have to eat. <laughs> That's the first mistake that people make when they're trying to grow their butt. It takes a lot of calories to grow a butt, so I'm just going to put that out there. So it's more about that proximity to failure than it is necessarily about like the perfect reps and sets of that. So even if you have to have a range. And so don't think about it as like, I stop at eight. I stop when I only have two left. Like, and especially this trendiness, just like the cycle training of menopause specific workout programs, because for many of these, these women, they never, they maybe ran or did cardio or walked, but they never did resistance training. Trust me, if I could quick fix my recovery, I would be doing it. But unfortunately, it just looks a lot like going to bed really early. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are back with Alyssa Olnek, PhD, for part two of our conversation on optimizing exercise for women. If you haven't listened to part one that went up last week, I suggest starting there and then listening to part two, today's conversation. Across the two parts, you'll learn about myths related to women and exercise, whether women should approach resistance training and cardio differently to men, how to set up resistance training to grow a particular muscle group, for example, your booty, why restricting calories and or carbohydrates might be holding back your progress in the gym how to know that your sets in the gym are actually effective, how to know if you're overtraining and need to reduce your load or even take a day off, whether you should ice plunge, how to do cardio effectively, how much protein you should target, what supplements can help you achieve your physical fitness goals, and plenty more. All shot in 4K in a friend's LA workshop, perfect for watching on YouTube. Let's do it. Please enjoy part two with Alyssa Olenek, PhD. I want to come back to sort of where we started this conversation. We were talking about sex differences and you you mentioned there's not a lot of evidence for sort of adjusting the exercise prescription for different phases of the menstrual cycle, but there are some legitimate sex differences yeah. between men and women. Are those sex differences big enough such that this hybrid training program we're talking about, mm -hmm. resistance training, some high intensity interval training, cardio, and then some steady state cardio yeah. would look different. And if so, how would they look different to uh, the training that a man would do? Yeah. So the one thing I always like to emphasize is that women aren't men, but women aren't a different species. So when we think about exercise training and adaptation and the mechanisms that just drive the responses to training, they're going to be very similar. So it's not that we're gonna have these like massively distinctly different training programs, but there are some sex differences when it comes to physiology that might inform different things that we think about with our training. And so, you know, the first being that when it comes to resistance training, you know, like I, I alluded to this earlier, I mentioned it, that, you know, females and males respond very similarly to progressive training interventions and training programs and all of this stuff and have that same relative potential. The one thing there is that there's potentially the ability for females to train at a higher percent of their one rep max, or they might have like, you might be able to do like, I don't know, five reps at 85% or 90% of your one rep max, but your one rep max might then not be as high as it might be predicted on like a one rep max calculator due to like a little bit of neuromuscular inefficiency that we see there, just some a little bit of differences there. Um, but part of that is also, you know, females are very fat oxidative and more oxidative in nature and potentially have more type one muscle fibers um, and have better essentially muscular endurance or endurance by nature across the board with that, with the caveat of like, you don't just come out trained. I really like to emphasize that. Like there are very big training differences that we see as females. But you have more potential yes. for building endurance capacity, whereas men would have more potential for Slightly, speed yeah. and power. Males are more glycolytic. They use more carbohydrate during exercise training. They're more, you know, potentially, you know, well, they are, they're more powerful and they can produce more force in their, in their muscle because of their sex differences in testosterone and that exposure to the muscle cell. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't adapt. Estrogen itself also is a, is a hormone that, in, in, that encourages strength and hypertrophy. It's anabolic. It is. Estrogen is anabolic. It is. And so that is why when we see some of this data that, again, isn't like super concrete, it's a little messy, that is early with some of the, the menstrual cycle stuff, there's maybe a benefit for strength or hypertrophy um, when estrogen is is high. Or that's is that the late 
follicular Yeah, that phase. late follicular phase into ovulation. And that's also why you see with um, mixed oral contraceptives that have a, a steady dose of estrogen, you actually see potentially more muscle gain or no, not blunted muscle gain because of that exposure to estrogen is kind of the thought process of why that's there. And so- But that's just measuring when someone is at their strongest, right? Yes. It's not necessarily measuring does strength training at that time lead to better long-term performance or strength? Yes. Because it could be that even though you're not as strong in different parts of your cycle- You can still make <laughs> progress. Yes. You can make and progress. So we have a few training interventions, but none of them are like very good. Like the best one we had still, the, the, the individuals were- training themselves and the data ends up being like really non-significant across the cycle when you remove birth control users from the study. And then there's a pilot study that was okay. And we have a few single limb studies um, or and like those have like kind of, they're great because that person is the control and there's crossover, but the three or four of those, like it's like 50-50 on if we saw positive adaptations and different components of either cross-sectional area or strength output. So like the, the, the idea and thought right now is there might be some potential benefit to being more hypertrophy or strength focused when estrogen is higher. And my take on that is, okay, that might be there. We might need more data to say that. But like, if again, auto-regulation, if you feel better in your follicular phase or ovulation phase or whatever that looks like in your training, and you can up your weights or your, your volume because you feel good and you're recovering, then that's fine. Go ahead, do that, right? In contrast of when you might feel poor otherwise. But, you know, to circle back to that point there, I think people think that, you know, Females can't gain muscle or get strong because they don't have testosterone, and that's not true. Estrogen is very, you know, it's 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 kind of our superpower hormone, and that's why you see this this stark contrast with menopause of where we see, you know, this insensitivity to protein or more protein breakdown or muscle loss or shifts in body composition, and a lot of that comes from that loss of estrogen. That's not to say that peri and postmenopausal individuals like suddenly can't be strong or gain muscle or get strength. People can get stronger as in, in old age with training exposure. But all that to say that it's like we're not we're not, not getting stronger or adapting or responding to exercise training programs because we are have lower volumes of testosterone or because we have estrogen. And so with that being said, you know, we might be able to do more reps at higher percentages of our one rep max or potentially just be better at volume and, and that sense in the gym and training. And again, this is me very speaking like we don't have this like super concrete absolute evidence of this stuff, but I'm okay with saying, yeah, you might be able to handle more volume or be able to do more weight on like your high volume sets than maybe potentially your male counterparts in training. And I've seen this in myself when I'm doing like very strength heavy squat cycles. Like I can just crush through volume on, on my training of high reps and sets in ways that I think that my male coach is like, I can't, I can't do that similarly. They're getting right? fatigued sooner. Yeah, they're getting fatigued sooner. We have more of that that oxidative phenotype, oxygen using phenotype, more type one muscle fibers. But on the contrary with that, like so with resistance training, I don't think programs need to look that different. I think that what most, you know, females are doing for resistance training is kind of not the best. Like I think it I Unpack think like that. I think they do a lot of garbage training programs. I think they do a lot of like we talked about it a little bit earlier, where they're doing like eight to 10 exercises and they're all four to 10 to 12 reps and they're not super specific and they're just, they're not- Different muscle groups. Yeah, they're doing like a leg day that is like six hamstring exercises in a row. You know, the very classic Instagram Fitspo workout or they're doing the group fitness classes where they're just doing like a cardio workout essentially with that or they're just doing that going through the motions underloaded stuff or they're just doing too many things in in their training sessions rather than pulling back and having it be specific of either you know whether it's body splits or specific splits across the week depending on like what they're they're training for um can we break this down yeah we can let's, keep going keep we this. can keep going let's, down this i won't pivot into the endurance <laughs> thing quite yet we can keep staying in this lane let's keep this really yeah. simple yeah there's a someone listening yeah and she's like i just want to grow my booty yeah. Right. So let's focus on one body part here. One body part. All right. Okay. What principles does she need to be thinking about? What does she need to adhere to, yeah. follow in order to get that muscle group to respond? Yeah. One, I won't rant on this, but I will say, well, because we just talked about this. If you want to grow your butt, you're going to have to eat. <laughs> That's the first mistake that people make when they're trying to grow their butt. It takes a lot of calories to grow a butt. So I'm just going to put that out there. Two, you want to think about mechanical tension. 
So mechanical tension is going to be the biggest driver of muscle growth and hypertrophy. And that is putting tension on the muscle. So it's, it's, it's essentially stretching to that load. And then you want to think about really going through that full range of motion and then getting the, the most out of that tension when you're, when you're doing strength training programs. So you don't want to be doing like, so for example, like the hip thrust is really popular for females. And I, I'm, I'm transparently a little bit of a hip thrust hater because I just don't really like it as much. But I think that they, they miss out on the fact that like, that's a compliment to things like that, but you want to still be doing these training moves that are doing full range of motion that you can load heavy and put tension on the muscle that you're trying to go. Where that's like a that's a good example of like a partial range of motion or a top range of motion focused exercise. I don't think that. What's the benefit or advantage of going like all the way to the end? Yeah, or closer to the end. Of yeah, the range? you're getting that full stretch of that muscle, and a lot of it. I'm and I'm not like the hypertrophy expert. From what I know from this field, though, is though like that full range of motion is where you're getting the most benefit and most hypertrophy potential or the greatest results. There's some stuff coming out now about like partials and if you should do short range or long range, but for 99% of individuals who aren't in that bodybuilding sphere, it doesn't matter. Like, like for mo especially the people that are probably listening to this and consuming this, you don't need to get into the weeds of that because what we know makes you grow is going to be going through the full range of motion. So we're talking like full range of motion squat patterns. And it doesn't have to be just barbell squats. It can be like your split squat or your lunges. Those are great for like glute development or lower body development, which I know a lot of women want to grow their lower body. Um, or like full range of motion RDLs or, you know, thinking about large muscle group activation, getting the most bang for your buck. And then yes, like, but things like the glutes, you can refine, like maybe you are doing some hip thrust as a complementing, or you're doing maybe some isolation stuff of, you know, the smaller muscle groups, but the things that are going to get you the most bang for the buck are the movements that are going to take you through that full range of motion and that you can load heavy, like a heavy step up is going to get you probably way more of a stimulus for growth than like your 30 pound banded glute kickback so to speak. Like you want to be able to put load and tension on that muscle. And, and then of course, there's a component of volume that we talked about earlier, which the load itself is part of the equation of volume. So volume is going to be your reps and sets by load. And then it's like essentially total tonnage or pounds or kilos that you essentially moved in that training session. And you want to progress that over time. So the way that you do that is either you do more sets or you do more load. And you don't want to sacrifice like load for intensity. Like you don't want to go to like 30% of your one rep max and not do it for enough reps and sets, so to speak. You still want to make sure it's a high enough for that stimulus. Um, but and you, you can only really increase sets per week to a certain point where yeah, you know, those workouts just become way too long. And and I think that's there's a pretty big consensus of like, yeah, you can go up to 20 or 20 plus high volume for hypertrophy sets per week. Sets per week and there's this big conversation around that right now, but you don't necessarily need 20 sets per week to make something grow, but you need that's more about the quality of the sets that you're doing. And I think a lot of women fall into the trap of doing a lot of quantity, but not that quality because they, and this isn't just women. Like I, I think everyone gen pop underloads their, their weight training. They don't lift heavy enough or they can do more than what they're doing. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, I think you said women tend to underestimate how many reps they have in reserve. Yes. I believe also sort of inexperienced novice mm -hmm. lifters tend to do that. So the yes. more experienced you get, the better you understand how many reps you have left, probably because you've gone to failure. Yeah. Often. And, and it, it's a skill. I think people think that they're going to, and I see this with clients all the time. They're like, RPE is so confusing and so hard. I, I can't figure it out. And I'm like, you just have to keep trying it and trial and error. And what happens is over time, like you're, this is like your perfect RPE target and you're going to go like this, but then over time, you're going to get closer and closer to that as you refine that, that skill. It's a skill just like anything else. And you're not going to be good at it the first time you do it. But the way you get better at that is one, take something that doesn't scare you. Like, I think that like, if you take a novice and you say, go max out your back squat, like don't do that because they they don't have the, the skill to do that because that's, that's a high skill high confidence type lift, or they might not feel comfortable going through the range of motion, or they might, and it's not to say like, oh, if you load that, you're going to break in half or anything like that. They're just, they're not going to be able to take that to, to their max because they probably just don't have the skill to do that at the time. But if you give someone like a bicep curl and you're like, take that set to failure, I think that's a great way for people to see one, going to failure doesn't kill you. And two, what that actually feels like. And that absolutely comes with training age. And that's one of my great, the, the, the best things I think to help people anchor what that actually feels like is to take a set of something to failure and see, okay, I've been doing, I've been doing shoulder presses with 40 pounds 
for like three sets of eight for the last two weeks. So what happens if I go to 45 pounds? Or what happens if I do, okay, you're doing three sets of eight, but you keep stopping at eight, eight pounds on that. But what happens if you just take that set to failure? And you see when you tell people to take those sets to failure sometimes that they end up going to like 15 or 20 reps, which means that they can they can do more load than what they're doing. So what's what's the cost of that? Like what's if someone is constantly going into the gym, because you mentioned quality before, so I really want to define yes. what quality is. So if someone's going in, selecting a weight, and in their mind, they, they've they already established I'm doing eight reps. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they could have got to 15. So that now they've got seven reps in reserve. Yeah. But they tick that off as a set done for the week. What's What's the downside of that? So I always like to say to anyone doing any sort of movement, your movement's never usually wasted, that you're not getting no benefit from being in the gym and training, but you're not getting as much bang for your buck out of that set as you could have been doing. So if people struggle with that, something that I like using is ranges instead of set targets of that. So instead of it being you're going to eight, well, you're going to eight to 10 and either you work up in reps and then, oh, I got to 10 reps or maybe it's 15, maybe even it's bigger, eight to 15. Cause we know that what matters more than anything is the load, proximity to failure and, and the, the tension that you're putting on it. So for the most part, hypertrophy isn't like, oh, this amount of reps and sets is exactly perfect. It's a, it's a spectrum and we see it up to 30, but I, you know, I think for most people, I really like the like six to oh, 15 So you could range. choose a, 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 a lighter weight, Yes, but you're doing more reps, but you're still getting to that same point. And you're still getting to that where same you have point. Two reps left. Yeah. Yes. And so it's more about that proximity to failure than it is necessarily about like the perfect reps and sets of that. So even if you have to have a range. And so don't think about it as like I stop at eight. I stop when I only have two left is a better way of thinking of that. But if you don't know what that feels like, don't do this for every single exercise every single time you go to the gym. But if you if you can't figure out what you're doing, take something to failure and figure out what, what that feels like and actually give yourself a gauge of like how much you're underloading yourself. And then if you find, oh my gosh, I can add so much more weight to this, then just wash that set. Like, you, well, you have a failure set, but if you go and do a set and you underload yourself and you realize like, oh, I just finished that set and I picked 30 pounds and my RP was like four when I did that, well, just call to warm up and do another set or make a note. If you're short on time, make a note for next week. Hey, start at 45 next week instead of 30 and do the next two sets. If you're doing three of higher quality and call today, I think people worry so much of like, well, what if I underload or overload a set? I'm like, I would rather you overload by accident every once in a while and say, Oh, I need to pull back on that next set. Then chronically be below the threshold of what you need to train. And you're not, if you're not doing failure stuff, every single exercise, every single day, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. It doesn't, it's not like you're going to like ruin your entire training if you go to failure and not recover on one set. And this is why I like, I like doing it with like accessories as people are gaining like confidence in the heavy compounds if they're doing those or machines might feel more comfortable for people to train with because you have more of that locked movement pattern of that. Um, but if you are doing like the heavy barbell compound movements and you are trying to train for strength or hypertrophy with those, usually those are used more for strength, is I like using once people are adapted and trained, not necessarily beginner AMRAPs, so as many reps as possible. So you take a weight that you've been training at for the last block and you start with that and then you do it until you can't do any more reps. And I love using that as like a checkpoint with clients because it's a great way for them to say, oh, wow, I've really been underloading this lift. Oh, now I see how much more I can be doing. So you know next time, okay, I can do more weight. And lifting is also a skill. So it doesn't mean that like if you plug that into like a one rep max calculator, what it tells you to lift will be perfect, so to speak. But it gives you a better idea of like, oh, I've been doing this for eight reps for the past month, but I just did 17 reps at max effort on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe maybe you're not doing 17 reps for three sets for that at that, at that overall effort of two reps in reserve, but maybe you could have been doing 13 reps for all of that every single week. Or you could have been adding, you know, 20 pounds to that lift to get to that RPE target. And I think that a lot, a lot of women are more scared, in my opinion, of injury and weightlifting associated injury or damage than I think males are in the gym. I think when we think about sex differences, honestly, I think some of that confidence becomes more of the, the issue of starting because I think we're not exposed to it at such a young age. We don't feel like we're welcome. We feel like we're being judged. We don't know what we're doing. I think those are important things to also consider here and the factor of like what are sex differences in training in the gym. Um, and so 
I'm really big on like, well, what can we do to get confidence in you and show you that you you can do things or it, you're safe doing this thing? Um, how do we gradually expose you to those things? So it's not like everybody, it's a wasted point of time. Like if you don't walk in on day one and can't go within proximity to failure. With beginners, I'm usually giving them a lot more RPE6 level effort stuff as they gain comfort and confidence and moving through things. So the gym's already intimidating as it is, but they're learning the movement patterns, they're setting the behavior, they're learning their way around a weight training session, and then we start to bring up intensity once we kind of build that foundation of confidence and trust. Especially like, you know, again, that psychosocial component of it, of like trust in our bodies, like so much of that stuff has told us to ignore your bodies, ignore your signals like I talked about earlier. And I think a lot of you know, women just haven't built that scale, that that sense of self-trust and pride and like confidence within their bodies quite yet in all of their training, or they only know on the contrary how to push themselves to absolute failure, but more so in like a cardio, I need to be sweating, I need to be grinding it out, I need to be doing like the hardest circuit training thing ever rather than, oh, this is a really hard set of weight training and I feel fatigued after this set, but I'm not like on the floor heavy breathing, sweating. And think that's hard for people too with weight training because it doesn't feel as like exertional as cardiovascular type stuff can be. And knowing that you can push hard in those sessions and you should still need a pretty solid recovery, but you're not going to feel like this, I just got done with a CrossFit class type feeling after that. It's going to feel different and valuing that and how that proximity to failure feels there differently and putting in that effort into like strength output, not just like a cardiovascular, turning your lifting again into a cardiovascular stimulus. Okay, this is really, really important information. So I kind of I want to summarize some of it and yes. then get you to to check that I've got it right. But I think a lot of women and men are turning up to the gym and they have their exercises that maybe they have chosen themselves or have been given those exercises and they've been given a rep range and you go from exercise to exercise. And you just tick off the box. Yeah. I'm going to do 10 reps or I'm going to do 12 reps with less focus on what is more important from what I'm hearing mm -hmm. is proximity to failure, intensity. Right. And so this, what you're describing to me is a, it's a very, it's a shift in the way that you're thinking mm -hmm. as you approach your training. Yeah. So from a hypertrophy point of view, there's a, a, a large range of mm -hmm. reps yeah. that can induce hypertrophy from six to, to 30. Yeah. Um, so the, the number of reps is somewhat less important. What's more important is are you taking that set mm -hmm. to induce the right degree of failure yeah. to then act as the stimulus to get muscle protein synthesis yeah. and in order to do that, to know that you're within two reps of failure, you need to understand what failure feels like. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good summary. Okay. In terms of overall resistance training programming, so you, you mentioned there we, we spoke about, you know, 20 to 30 sets across a week. There's, there's, there's people that are talking about that. What's the upper volume of sets per week? You said I'd rather people focus on quality sets yeah so coming back to this girl that's uh wanting to grow her booty yeah how how many quality sets per week should she ideally be aiming for in the perfect world yeah so i like the idea as i have this thing i like to share with people as like within an individual exercise i think a minimum is like two hard sets like you, I would rather you do two sets really hard of something, especially if you're like, most people are short on time and they're trying to get things in. So per exercise, per session, I like like this minimum of like two hard sets. You don't need four, five, six sets of this stuff necessarily for this within one single workout. I mean, there, there you know, there's some nuance there of like strength work might be like one or two reps and you might do more of these higher reps, but we're talking more like hypertrophy and muscle building right now which within this. And so I like, okay, when you're looking across a week of training, I think let's, one, spread the frequency of what you're targeting those muscles. You know, the data we have shows that overall volume in the week, just like overall protein and stuff like that matters more than anything. But I think it's harder to shove all of your volume on one day. So I like the idea of spreading that out over two or three days across the week. So that way you're not so, so if you're only doing a workout for your booty and you're doing six exercises on Tuesday, cause that's booty day. But by the time you get to the sixth exercise, you're so fatigued from doing that other stuff. I would rather you'd have only maybe two exercises on that day that are really high quality that you're doing for those two or three sets 
for that on Tuesday. And then Thursday is another leg day. And you're doing those two or three other exercises for quality on that day. So you're not fatiguing and spreading that across the week with increasing frequency. So you end up doing that 12 or 15 sets yeah. across a couple of different sessions as yes. opposed to trying to do all that in one session over an hour. Yes. Or- I, I think you get more bang for your buck by, by doing that. Um, I also think that like three to six sets of per muscle group per week is a good minimum for people of high quality, especially when we're thinking about regular people. And then maybe getting that up to like that six to 10, maybe 10 to 15. I I think most gen pop regular people aren't needing to go up to that like 20, but there's that like kind of six to 20 range. But again, there's that argument of like how high quality, I know I keep saying quality, but like how much worthwhile are you getting out of those sets? Like going through the motions for 20 sets might not get you as much results as like actually training with intention at that proximity to failure, loading it appropriately for like 10 sets sets for half for half the total work. And so that's why I keep reiterating and emphasizing that. Um, so, and I think that's too where we have to get down to the individual of like, okay, you know, I really, really want to... In- drive up my booty growth, specifically in this training phase. I'm going to maybe pull down other stuff that's fatiguing and I'm going to really increase my sets on this. And maybe you're doing more total sets in that phase of training because you're really focused on that, either that strength movement or that or muscle group that you're trying to drive up and build. And maybe you're shifting your total training efforts for the week um, to doing more sets there. And then when you're not focused on that main growth, you can, you're doing less, but you're still keeping that quality there or distributing it to elsewhere. And so it's not to say that like, there's a the hard, fast rule for every single person of how many sets, because you, everyone's going to respond differently too. When we look at the variation in studies of people who respond to certain rep range protocols, volumes, like you have the person on the upper end of the error bar and you have the person, on the lower end of the error bar. And so we're just speaking to averages, but you might be the person who might need a little bit more volume to drive that for you, more of a hard gainer, so to speak. Um, and that's where you can say, oh, okay, like I'm doing this consistent training program and I'm and potentially, you know what, I'm going to add another, I'm going to add a third exercise to this Tuesday day. So I'm doing three and three and I'm getting in maybe closer to that 12 to 15 per week because I need that extra bit. I think one of the big mistakes that that women make in the gym is they don't follow consistent progressive training programs. They're not overloading gradually over time and repeating workouts week after week. So they're not actually seeing the gains, the benefit they want from that consistency and that progression. So like reps and sets and volume and all this stuff is great. But if you're not doing something consistently and frequently enough that you know, okay, last week I did this and I'm going to try to increase this either whether it's every week or every few weeks because it's not always going to be perfectly linear, you can repeat that because you know how much you can lift on that and you've started developing the skill of doing that exercise and you you can kind of overload that more consistently than, well, uh, you know, this week I'm going to do step ups and hip thrusts and then next week I'm going to do reverse lunges and, and squats. And that's fine. You still will get potentially some growth, but I think when you do this haphazard random program that's not consistent, you're also not getting feedback about what's working and what's not working when you're trying to have these specific goals, especially like, you know, everybody wants a booty, right? Um, But booty building programming looks a lot like traditional strength training, but just emphasized on the glutes, right? Like a lot of, like, think about how many very, I mean, Dudes that don't skip leg day that do the heavy squatting and the heavy hinging and the heavy step ups and all like heavy posterior chain focused stuff, like they grow glutes for a reason, right? And similarly, like you look at a lot of females who aren't super obsessed with growing their glutes, but they do follow this progressive heavy loaded strength training and it kind of happens as a, as a byproduct of that type of training. And you might, you might like glutes specifically or any, lagging muscle for you, you might have to sprinkle in some specific things. But if you're following something consistently enough, you might be like, hey, you know what? Like, I need to drive up this a little bit because this isn't working for me in the same way that maybe it did for others at the same amount of volume or whatever. How does a woman know if the workout she's just done Mm -hmm. was effective? Or if her current program is effective? Like, is she actually making progress? Yeah. I think this is something that I see a lot of people struggle with because one, they don't feel wrecked after good resistance training sessions should feel hard. Um, You should feel potentially sore, fatigued, but not extremely. And I think people associate extreme fatigue, extreme soreness, extreme windedness, like coming off their training session as like, that was a high quality workout. I sweat a lot. I beat the crap out of me. I'm super sore. And good effective weight training often doesn't always look like that. And uh, the overall effort of it sometimes doesn't feel as 
high as some of those other things. But what I usually tell people is that when you, like I, we get a lot, I get this a lot with people. They're like, this isn't enough volume for me. This isn't enough volume. I need more volume in my training program. But usually my first thing is, are you loading heavy enough? Because if you start to take those sets at higher loads, cl pr closer to that proximity of failure, the higher RPE, they usually start to feel a lot harder. And so one of those things that I can, it's an easy thing to check in for people is if their training session is effective is did it require you to focus? Like that's, I think the easiest perceptual thing that you can tell people is like, did it require you to focus? Because if you're, if you're loading heavy or lifting heavy, you have to, you have to focus on the movement that you're executing and that you're doing. And then two, towards the end of your sets, did your reps start to slow down? If your reps, velocity. Did the velocity of that start to slow down? I think those are yeah. easy things that people can wrap their heads around. You have to be careful not to change the velocity. You're like, yes. because it can become a mind game, right? Yes. Like you, you, you feel like you have to focus when you're doing the work, even on the silliest of exercises, because you're really having to think about the muscle and what you're moving, and what you're doing. Because if I do a shoulder raise with two and a half pounds, I could just sit here all day and sit here and eventually I fatigue. But if I put a 15 on there, I'm having really to think about what that delt's doing and the movement that it's making. And then if I'm doing that closer to that proximity of failure that we keep talking about or closer to the higher end of weight, so, okay, at my first few reps, okay, those are fast. And then, oh, I'm going to six, seven, and I'm, I'm putting the same amount of effort or more effort in, but the muscle's moving slower. And that's where taking things to failure every once in a while is helpful because you can feel yourself slow down. You're like, oh, my muscles are not, they're going to feel less powerful. They're not contracting. And so, you know, that's a great way to know, like, okay, did I slow down towards the end of my sets? And if I didn't, okay, if your last rep is as fast as your first rep, you probably can add more weight or do more reps depending on what, what you're trying to progress with. And then I think those are two easy things for people to, to think about in their training. And then the third is like, if you only need 30 seconds to one minute of rest between your lifts, you're probably not loading them heavy enough. You really are going to need that full you know, people who are short on time, you might, you know, cut this down because people are getting in what they can. But that two to five minutes, like you, if you're loading your training heavy enough, especially heavy compounds, maybe for accessory work or more hypertrophy type stuff, like maybe 90 seconds to two minutes is you might not need as much like for a bicep curl as you need like a back squat. But you should feel like you actually need that full rest to recruit that muscle or have that same strength output be repeated in those next or subsequent sets. If you can do a workout and you're like, you know what? I'm ready to go again. Like that's a good indication that you're not. That last set was a warm up set. Yeah, that last set was a warm up set, and so those are easy things for people to feel like they and and it it doesn't mean that you're you're not getting any benefit. Resistance training is so important that no matter what form of it you do, it is, it is good for you. Um, but those are three things that I think are really helpful for people that I think are any like my mom could go to the gym and perceive those rather than me being like, you need an RIR too, mom, and proximity to failure, mechanical tension, and mTOR. Like, that means nothing to her. But I say, go until you feel like you almost couldn't do any more reps, right? Or did it slow down? Or did you have to really focus? Like, that focusing, I think, is really helpful for people. And then, like, do you actually need rest when you're doing this? If you don't, add more weight. And that's, I think those are three really easy things. And then if you walk out of the gym and you're like, I had a focus, I, I felt like I, those slowed down, and I actually had a rest between my sets, and I actually feel like a little bit fatigued. Like there should be some central nervous system fatigue coming out of that session. You're gonna have more for probably lower body or heavy compound days than maybe like your upper body day. But you should feel like, okay, I did work today in this session. And again, if you're going through the motions, I'd rather you do less sets of higher quality and get out sooner. If that is the issue, that's the limiting factor of your focus or your attention or your, your interest in it. I'd rather do less but higher quality and get in, get out, and get it done rather than just like, passively go and stay for 60 minutes if you don't want to be there. Now, what if someone goes into the gym, mm -hmm. they follow that protocol. Yeah. So they have to focus. They are taking the sets to a point where the speed of their reps drops off dramatically towards yeah. the end. And they need longer than a 30 to 60 second rest between sets in order to recover. But they don't necessarily feel sore the next day. Do you have to feel soreness in the muscles that you've trained in order for that to be beneficial? You don't. Some soreness is normal. Extreme soreness comes usually from two things. It's new or it's too much. And so the first one is we have this thing in exercise called the repeated bout effect. So if you go to the gym and you do something, the first time you do it, it's totally new. You are going to be so sore. You're not going to be able to like 
walk down the steps or sit down without that soreness or, you know, that cliche jokes about that because it's new. But if you go and do the same thing again next week, your body will be less sore because it's going to elicit less of an inflammatory response. It, it knows that. It sees and, it, and, it, and it's like, oh, I know this stressor and stimulus. This isn't as threatening. I'm gonna, or you're adapting to it or your body wants to adapt to that stress and stimulus that's skidding, but you have less of an inflammatory response. So you're less sore. Soreness is really just this immune response and inflammatory response that's like localizing at the muscle cells and that it's perceived by your nervous system. It's not necessarily like, oh, you're sore because your muscles are doing better. It's just a perception of this, this inflammatory response. And so you have less of that response the second time you see it. And it's usually eccentric exercise that does that more than anything else. So like if you run downhill a bunch, you're going to be really, really sore, but you're not growing muscle. Like that's the cliche model in exercise science is like downhill running is ex extreme eccentric muscle damage, puts a ton of damage in your muscles, elicits a huge immune response and people are super sore, but you're not growing muscle just because you're running downhill. So or else bodybuilders would be out yeah. there doing Yeah, that's actually running. my secret. That's my secret, all the downhill <laughs> running. Um, and so what you really want to think about is is maybe being in that two to four range on average. And every time you do a new exercise or you start a new block of training or you try something new or you bump up volume, like you might be a little sore and it's not, it's not a bad thing. Like you should, you shouldn't not never be sore. I think that, that the antagonist to like everyone being like soreness doesn't mean a good workout or muscle growth is people think that like, well, if you're working hard, you're going to be sore or fatigued. And at least shows you that you were working that yeah. muscle group. Yeah. You should have some soreness or fatigue and the more adaptable your program is or the more you do stuff or you know, potentially like sometimes I feel more sore if I'm doing more of a high volume hypertrophy phase or heavy volume lifting than I do when I'm like doing more strength work. I don't feel as sore or fatigued in that same muscular localization way because I, it's just not as much volume because it's like you're doing less reps. So it, even though it's heavy, it's not as fatiguing. So it doesn't always necessarily mean it's not working, but you're going to have some sort of localized fatigue or soreness. It just shouldn't be if it's greater than like a five or six out of 10, every single time you leave the gym, something's off with your sleep, your nutrition, or you're doing too much in the gym. Like one of those three things are impacting your recovery. Um, but also on that note, if you're sore, but you feel like you're doing a perfect amount of training volume, like look at your sleep and your nutrition, because it might not be your program. That's the issue. It might be like the things that are affecting your recovery. Um, but I think people think too on that, that I think makes this a little bit more clear is you don't need a million exercises as well. I think that's an important note to add to this too, is I think people think that they need to be doing a million exercises. Um, and you need maybe four to six high quality exercises where you feel like you're doing work. You're going to feel like you, you put an effort, you might feel a little bit fatigued or tired to have that carried in into your next session or day, but it shouldn't be this, like, I can't walk down the steps or lift up my hand to brush my hair every single time that you're working out. Is yeah. that counterproductive? Yeah. I think training to that point of soreness every single time you train, something's off. You're doing too much. You're, it's too novel all the time. You're not adapted to what you're doing or you're not eating or sleeping in a way that you're recovering from what you're doing. And so if you, you do these consistent repeated training programs, your soreness is going to really go away. And I think if you think about like the hybrid training thing, that's a good thing, right? Because you're going to bring soreness and fatigue in from session to session. But if you can keep it as regular and controlled and reduce that, then you're going to get higher quality in everything that you're doing because it's not going to carry over quite quite as much as if you do this, the same new thing every single week of training or these haphazard random workouts or random programs. Like even some of the like circuit training or CrossFit type models, usually the programming is still made to be like somewhat repeatable and consistent versus like, you know, the woman who's just doing a random different thing every single day of the week, or they randomly lift this day and they're going to do this this day. And they don't really know what they're doing when they go into the gym. And they might not, you know, they might be more sore than the work they actually put in just because it's new and different, not even because it was like quality of what they were doing. Is it okay to enter a workout with some soreness? So let's, if we come back to this example of growing glutes or you know, yeah. someone that's doing squatting on a Monday mm -hmm. and let's say they want to do this workout twice a week. So Thursday rolls around and they're a little bit sore. Is it okay to go and do yeah. those same exercises again that work out or uh, stress those sore muscles? Yeah. So training with soreness and fatigue is 
normal. It's going to happen, especially if you train hard and you train long enough. Um, that's why that's a big reason though. I like spreading that volume of different muscle groups across the week. Cause it helps kind of reduce some of that soreness and fatigue. Cause you're spreading it out. So it's like a little bit more distributed. Um, but if you're doing like a leg or a full body day on Monday and then you're doing another one on Thursday and you have a little bit of residual fatigue or soreness. And again, it's not like I can't walk. I'm so sore. I'm like, I'm almost swollen kind of soreness and fatigue. Yeah. You're totally fine. That's completely normal. I get this a lot of the time too, with like people who lift and do running. They're like, can I run on sore or fatigue legs? And I was like, I haven't not ran on sore or fatigue legs in like six years. Like it's just part of training hard. And that just comes with the territory of it. You're not harming anything unless it's to that extreme point where you're just damaging stuff that's damaged and not recovered. Like that's kind of goes back to what I said earlier, where like, are you digging yourself into a deeper hole than, than you need to be digging yourself into? So it's not that it's inherently bad, but if you are at like an eight out of 10 soreness, you don't feel recovered, you feel super beat up. And a great indication of that is if you go into that next session and you can't have that same strength or power output or like muscular power, because you're going to have a lot of inflammation and fluid and swelling in those muscles, it's probably an indication that, okay, I probably overdid it on that day, or maybe I need to take an extra day for this to recover. Because that peak of that soreness is usually about 48 to 72 hours after a training session, that peak of that inflammatory response. But if you feel like, okay, I'm, I can't move anything in this, you probably just need to take a step back, recover, maybe do something that's going to Prioritize just, recovery. Yeah. I, something that I think I know myself, I, I have, grapple with this mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to recovery. Yeah. Is, you know, we like to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, if I relied on motivation, just feeling amazing to get into the gym, I would get in nowhere nearly as frequently as I do. You and, right? I know people don't think that about me, but you and me both. <laughs> right. So it requires a lot of discipline. So I turn up and train days when – Honestly, if you asked me in the morning, would you rather just stay at home and sit on the couch or go and train? My answer would be I would rather sit on the couch. Um, what I'm trying to get at here is deciphering between not being recovered and therefore prioritizing rest and having a, a kind of off day mm -hmm. and versus maybe not feeling like you want to train, mm -hmm. being super motivated, but physically you know, you can go and train and will benefit from it. And whether do you use things like heart, resting heart rate or heart rate variability? Are these like objective markers that we can kind of, uh, you know, verify or cross-reference how we're personally feeling against? Yeah. So I personally have the mantra of I don't want to isn't a good enough reason not to work out because you're not going to want a, a whole bunch. And if you listen to that, you're never going to exercise and train, especially when we think about regular gen pop people where we have kids or family or partners or stress or work or jobs and we're carrying all that residual fatigue. I mean, I, I, I even struggle with a ton of exercise resistance because of my workload, but I'm always really grateful that I did the thing. So I think that like the first one is like, I just, I don't want to, for me personally, is like a level of like, okay, but like, let's dig deeper of like, do you just not want to? Or is there something else that's making you feel like this isn't a good reason to train, right? Like, is it, oh, I just, I'm not in the mood. Well, you're not always going to be in the mood to, to exercise and train, but I, you know, I like to think of like, okay, do I value it? Is it important to me? Do I actually want this? And I think that's a good thing with clients too, is like leaning in on them and being like, okay, well, like, what's your priority here within this and having that reflection within that and recognizing that discipline is really just having an environment that's set up to support you to get make those choices easy for you. And so I also really think, and this is like a little bit more mindset out of my niche and thing is like, thoughts are just thoughts. They don't have to be your truth. You can say, I don't want to be doing this and still go and and go and do it and get it done. And you can still say, I don't want it. Or like the couch is always going to be there. Like you can sit on the couch later, but right now you need to train. And, but on the contrary of that recovery standpoint, like other than like the, the coaching mindset stuff, which I can give you people to interview, that would be fantastic to talk about that more, um, would be, you know, I like the pillars of, am I slept and rested? Am I fed? Am I hydrated? If I'm ticking those three boxes, I'm probably fine to work out and exercise. And I think on the soreness fatigue type thing is like, okay, unless I'm in like a peak block of training, am I below like a five, maybe six at the most of like how I feel? If you're like at that seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, 
And there's that difference of like, if I'm peaking for a race or I'm at the peak week of a lifting cycle and I'm really pushing things, I know I'm going to be bringing some extra fatigue with that. But that's been planned for or increased to with my training program. But in general, if I'm fed, if I'm rested, if I'm hydrated, and I, I guess you can add there, like, I'm not like a five to 10 out of complete soreness. Like, I don't feel like really like, I mean, when you're, you're beat up, you can like see the swollenness of your muscles and that kind of thing. And that that's where I think people can be like, okay, maybe I need to take an extra rest day or push this workout a day forward and let myself recover a little bit more before I go into that training session, because it's just, it's not going to be highest quality, but that's where we need to look back and like, what did I do on that day to overdo it? Or okay, maybe that training session just made me extra sore this week, but the past two days I've under eight calories. I missed a ton of protein. I have been sleeping like crap and saying, okay, well maybe what I need to do today is just focus on recovering and move that to the next day kind of thing. And that's where it's, it's both an assessment of the training program, but also the lifestyle things that are affecting that recovery. But to speak to those other things, I mean, you know, Resting heart rate will go up if, you're, if your recovery is poor, you're under-recovered or potentially. So if that's like kind of trending up, potentially you're like, okay, maybe I'm putting too much stress and strain on my body. I think HRV is tricky because especially for people who aren't dialing in every aspect of their life, your stressors that aren't just coming from training can impact that too as well. So your HRV might be low, but it might be because you're stressed or other things are coming in from your lifestyle. And I think if regular people wait to train until their their life is optimized. They're never going to train. There's too many things going on. But I think that those things can be helpful for saying, okay, well, there's a trend recently where this is always poor or trending poor. So what is, is it, do I need to sleep more? Do I need to adjust my nutrition? Is my training too much for what I can recover from right now? Do I need to be managing my stress? Because all those factors are going into those things. I think that my general recommendation is don't rely on the recovery score of whatever fitness tracker you're using because it's not telling you the full picture of your life. Go to the gym. if you Unless you feel completely trashed, don't go to the gym. But go to the gym if you're like, mm, am I just tired? Like, How's this going to go? Whatever it is. And give yourself 20 minutes. If you get under the bar or you start training and you feel like hot garbage, you don't start to feel better, go home. Turn around, stop in the workout for the day. But if you get in and you start moving and you start feeling good, or maybe you were just tired, maybe you just needed to get your mind off the thing that you were doing, maybe you just you just needed to get into the movement, or you know, don't judge how you're going to perform that day just on how you feel. Like let the bar speed or how powerful you feel or what your effort feels like be like very very come in on a clean slate and let your workout inform how you're going to feel that day. But it's okay to say like this is going to dig me deeper than it's going to move me forward. But then it's also for people who are really busy and trying to make progress in fitness goals and body composition in life. Like you're just, it's not going to ever be perfect. And that's why even with the perfect training splits, like it's just get it in, get it in and get it done no matter what that looks like. Because optimal for most of us is never going to be optimal, but we can make a lot of progress just doing these things. Um, but do take audit of like, you know, if those markers and indicators are constantly saying like, hey, you're beating yourself in, to the ground every single day and pull yourself back out of that and say like, okay, well, what do I need to do to take care of myself better if this is all the time? But if it's one off day here or there and you feel fine, but you, maybe your, your HRV is a little bit lower and you get to the gym and your workouts feels fine, like complete the work and then just try to like, you know, try to recover better for the next day or take care of yourself. And also like that's where auto regulation comes in. Like ask yourself how you feel because your fitness tracker isn't, isn't your, you know, your identity. That's not exactly necessarily like going to, to tell you the story of like what your training session is going to be like that day, especially when so many things go into recovery scores or HRV heart rate is a little more linear of like your heart rate is 90 when you wake up, but normally it's 55, potentially maybe something's going on there. Right. But if it's like, like when I'm peaking for races, my resting heart rate might start to creep up a little bit higher when I wake up because my recovery is not as good, but it should go down as soon as you start recovering or taking care of yourself again or decreasing that stress, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So prioritizing sleep, nutrition, looking at your training volume if you feel like you're not recovering. Yeah. What do you think about cold water immersion? And it's where I get canceled on this podcast. Whether <laughs> <laughs> it, is it helpful at all for reducing muscle soreness and promoting recovery? So it is, but it potentially is at the cost of muscle growth and that inflammatory process is important. So, you know, when you look at cold water immersion, it's 
it's not that I think that if you're doing it, you're a terrible person, you should stop and you're stupid. It's that I think it should be intentionally used strategically. So when we look at, you know, the muscle's response to that cold water immersion, especially like if you're actually physically dunking yourself in ice, it does blunt and decrease an inflammatory response that we're getting from exercise. But we want that inflammatory response that we're getting for exercise. And so the literature shows that if you do it, especially immediately after resistance training, you're potentially blunting or reducing those effects of that training session. We don't have data right now that says, well, what if you do it before? Or what if you do cold water showers instead? Or four hours after. Or four or hours, hours after. after. I'm more inclined to say to do it before maybe than like after, because that recovery response is occurring for days after. Like it's, it's that inflammatory response that we're having in response to training. It's, you know, it's there for 24, 48, 72 hours after. Right, so, but if you do it before is it, and you train today yeah, before like, that, it's, it's within that window now. It's still within that. So like I, I, you know, but when you look at it though, it doesn't appear to impact performance or things um, after like there was like mis, mixed martial, martial arts or fighter type people that they looked at and it appeared to not necessarily impact that. Um, and it does look like it doesn't negatively impact adaptations to aerobic training. It might actually potentially enhance those. So if you're going to do it, you know, maybe you're doing it after cardio training sessions or other forms of things. Or maybe if you're in your season of specifically trying to gain muscle strength and hypertrophy, you're reducing that or pulling that back. It's just like the cardio thing. It doesn't fully stop it from happening. You're still going to probably gain muscle to some degree. It just might be reducing that the extent of which that might happen. And I think the, there's this, this bias of people who, again, have already been muscular, who started doing this cold water immersion. They're like, it didn't kill my gains. I'm like, but you, you still have the muscle that you developed when you didn't do it. So I think that, you know, but that's where it's beneficial is like the reason people use it in sporting events or between like Inter like intervals at the CrossFit Games or between back-to-back -back races or these things is because you don't you don't care about adapting in those period of time. You care about reducing that inflammatory response because you don't want to be sore and have that fatigue or that impaired muscle power output that happened. Because essentially what happens when you're fatigued or sore, you don't, you don't your muscle fibers don't generate as much power. So you don't, but you're not trying to adapt in those moments. Like, you know, they're they're just trying to recover between session to session. So that there's this people who are like, well, my favorite basketball player did ice water immersions and they were a great athlete. Yeah. And I'm like, but they weren't in that moment between games. They weren't caring about hypertrophy. No, they're just trying to get up for the next game. They're just trying to get up for the next game. So that they're, the, the cons for it in response to resistance training is a pro when it comes to short-term recovery, but not long-term muscular adaptations. But I think that that, you know, if people like it and they want to do it, I don't, I just like, I don't care. I don't think it's the optimal thing for muscle strength and hypertrophy. So if you're going to do it, place it on its own or potentially around cardiovascular training, or maybe don't do it every single day of, of, of the week, um, you know, or say, hey, I've got the muscle that I want and I don't really care. Like, but that's important yeah. for the person who is feeling stuck and doesn't have yeah. the muscle that they want. Yes. You know, maybe they're 50 or 60, they're at that stage of menopause, mm -hmm. they're finding it difficult to build muscle then what I'm hearing from you is this might be something that is counterproductive yeah. to their goal, their specific yeah. goal at that point of time. Yeah, it's, it's, at least with that. Like when I talk about this, people are like, well, I, I found X, Y, and Z other benefits from that. I'm like, you very well may. And like, that's totally fine. But I think that we need to recognize, especially, especially for females, is how important that muscle is and how, I mean, for everyone with aging, but especially like when you go through peri and postmenopause, like that, that is the most important thing to preserve and try to keep or build before you go into that. It's like your resiliency army armor to all these things. And so, you know, I, I really think that that's where you might want to consider the pros versus cons or the frequency or how much you're using it if you do like it, especially at the expense of your muscle. And so it's not to say if you like it, you can't do it, but I would be considerate about how you're utilizing it. Um, in response to those things or take it out for a season of life while you are specifically building and focusing. And that's the same thing with cardio. Like people are like, well, I did a ton of cardio and, and killed my gains or impaired this. And I'm like, well, you just need to pull down the volume of that to ramp up that lifting if that's your specific goal. And that's where I take those seasons with that as well of like, make the goal the goal. Like, you know what I mean? Like when you're focusing on one thing, make the goal the goal. But when it comes to recovery, I think that People want all these fancy bells and whistles of everything that you can do, but the sleep and the nutrition are going to be the biggest drivers and then volume management in your training. If, you, if you're doing more volume than you can recover from, then you're never going to do it. And I, and I like to say, people think when I say that, that means that you can't ever do high volume or it's 
counter to the fact that I exercise like 10 hours a week, but high volume is earned. You can't adapt to it with time. You can't, you can't start up here. You have to build up the capacity to recover and tolerate what you're doing gradually over time. And then you can't do more and more and more. But outside of that, what you eat and sleep and potentially maybe supplements are going to be the only things that are going to make these big rocks forward on these things rather than like these ice baths or Norma Tech boots or foam rolling or all the things that are, trust me, if I could quick fix my recovery, I would be doing it. But unfortunately, it just looks a lot like going to bed really early. <laughs> <laughs> it's less sexy. It's not, it's not, yeah. <laughs> Recently, I've been working with friend of the pod, Dr. Will Bolsowitz on his new brand, 38 Terra, an evidence-based prebiotic supplement to optimize gut health. To facilitate online sales, 38 Terra uses Shopify. The major reason 38 Terra chose Shopify over other e-commerce platforms was because of Shopify's focus on customer conversion. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading e-commerce platforms. If you're going to spend time and money on marketing, you wanna make sure you are converting the people who visit your site into loyal customers. What I also love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control in-house. The Shopify app store is home to thousands of customizable apps that can easily plug into your website to help with things like upselling, selling products on social media channels like Instagram and TikTok, and much more. To boost your conversion rate and grow your business, sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com forward slash proof. That's shopify.com forward slash proof, all in lowercase. I want to put a pin in supplements to try and finish on, on those. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned menopause. You did a post on Instagram titled The Menopause Conundrum. Mm -hmm. And I have a quote from you here. You wrote, most individuals report an average of approximately one to two kilograms of fat gain each year, specifically in the midsection, yeah. but also report no other changes in activity or eating behaviors. I want to start by saying this perception is valid. So there's this common experience mm -hmm. where to the woman's knowledge, they haven't changed the way that they're eating. They haven't changed the way that they're moving their body, but they're piling on the weight, especially around the belly. And that, of course, is frustrating. Yeah. It can be frustrating. I understand that. Disheartening. Unpack this conundrum for us. What's happening here and what can someone do about it? Yeah. So what happens is when you go through menopause, you have this deep, this, you know, you have perimenopause is just this period of time of like very haphazard hormones. I think everyone's trying to balance their perimenopause hormones. And I'm like, well, the state is just dysregulated hormones because your body's kind of going through this phase where eventually your estrogen is is essentially like bottom line. You have very low estrogen and that loss of estrogen shifts a lot of things in your body that you experienced in your premenopausal state. And so one of the things that comes along with that is this shift to more central adiposity. You start to take on more of the fat distribution of males in this menopausal state. And so part of that is one, you have more belly fat in general. So a lot of people aren't necessarily gaining weight or fat, but it is shifting uh, to the midsection. So you have part of that where you're getting more of that menopause belly that people like to call it. And that is, that is real. That is happening. You're just reshifting the weight because, you know, in the premenopausal state, you know, females tend to store more fat in their glutes and their hips and not as, or like their lower stomach a little bit, but not as much of that male pattern storage of that central body fat. And that's a positive and good thing because that is one of the reasons among others that we have reduced, you know, chronic disease risks and, um, you know, premenopausal, we have lower prevalence of cardiovascular and metabolic disease, but that decline in estrogen shifts to that central adiposity and does some other things. But what it does essentially is not only do you have more abdominal fat just in that area where you're seeing it, but you also have more visceral adipose tissue. And that's where it's more of an issue and more problematic and more worrisome because that's the adipose tissue that relates, relates to chronic disease and maybe potentially dysregulated metabolism or inflammation and all that stuff that not leads to these fatty liver disease, yes. type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's more of the hidden fat, but that is also in your abdomen. So you're kind of getting this increase, this shift of fat storage to the abdomen, and then this increase in visceral adipose tissue. And so like 
independent of any other changes, you might just shift your fat storage to your abdomen. And I know like I'm this premenopausal woman saying this. And trust me when I say like I'm I'm well prepared that I know it's gonna happen one day before people are like, you don't, you don't know what it's like. And I'm like, I sympathize. I hear it all of the time. And so you have this, but you also have weight gain that is associated with the menopause transition. I think it's like five to 10 kilos on average is the reported weight gain of the menopause transition. Over what, a five to 10 year period? Yeah. During that, 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 that transition, that's like the average reported weight gain um, from you know females who are going through that. Yeah. Menopause, just depending on people, how long they go through it. And this is due to, I think, a variety of factors. And so the conundrum is that they say, I haven't changed anything. And to some degree, that isn't true. And then some degree, it is true. Or the changes are happening without their knowledge. So one of the things is like, it's not like your your hormones play a role, but they aren't like changing the rules of everything else. Like, it's not like they're changing the rules entirely. And like things that didn't work for you premenopausal don't work for you, not necessarily because you need a whole different set of rules or a whole new game. It's that one, that decline in hormones means that your margin for error is lower. It also means that things are changing that are changing the way that you move and eat without you even recognizing that you're doing it. And so some of the things that we see are, one, you can't control the way your body's going to store fat, and that's unfortunate. And energy deficits and fat loss are the only way that you will actually- What about estrogen supplementation? So I actually don't know off the top of my head how much that that does change it. Because from my understanding that there is still weight gain, even with estrogen supplementation, it doesn't fully revert that fat gain from my understanding. Um, I think it does reduce some of the other symptomology or potentially effects of that chronic disease risk that we see from having that estrogen supplementation. But from my understanding, it doesn't fully revert um, some of that weight gain. Um, but what that might help with though, and there's some preclinical studies that show, so one of the things that we think potentially impacts this shift in metabolism or weight gain is that there's less spontaneous physical activity. And there's there's been mouse model studies that have shown um, that when you take these, these rats that are overectomized and you give them estrogen versus no estrogen, they're more active when you add back the estrogen. And there's some early data data in clinical trials with females that, you know, showed that when they were so that you could do these ovarian suppression trials where you suppress premenopausal women and then, or even postmenopausal women and then give them estrogen or other hormones back to like isolate the effects. And there's some suggestion that physical activity might be increased because of that exposure to estrogen. Or on the contrary, when you go through menopause, you might just be moving less and not realizing you're moving less. Like that spontaneous daily physical activity is potentially reduced without you saying, well, I haven't changed my exercise behavior habits, but you might be more fatigued or less aware of the fact that you're not doing this general daily activity. Like that- how many times a day do you get up off the couch and walk to the other side of the room yes. or reaching for things, mm-hmm. yeah. move- movement that you're not conscious of? Yeah, that that need or that daily activity of like movement or steps or things like that. And so you might not be aware of the fact that you're moving less because you're per- we're not really good at perceiving what we're actually doing unless we're kind of monitoring, assessing it, and managing that. But so one of the things that I usually recommend there is like, I think that's where like steps can be helpful for assessing. How active am I actually being or controlling that controllable? I don't, tracking your steps and hitting step targets and going for walks isn't considered non, like neat. I think a lot of people misuse neat. Any intentional activity is a neat. Neat is that spontaneous activity that you don't realize or know that you're doing, right? All the energy I burned talking with my hands today versus right. sitting here like this. But if you know that that, is going to potentially drop yeah. off, then you can offset that with a little, little bit more intentional move. Yes, and that doesn't have to be exercise. It can be just intentional. And that, and again, it doesn't even have to be, I mean, walking is just the easiest and most generic thing, but that can be cleaning your house, gardening, running errands. Like you might just be doing that stuff less or you can add that stuff in. It doesn't necessarily be, mean it be you have to be walking a million miles every single day to bring that back up or you become obsessed with that. But you might be like, you know, I used to walk 8,000 steps a day, but you know, I've been only really walking too. And that's a good indication of like maybe, okay, you should just can bring that back up to the level that you're doing, or you can just control your controllables. You know that you can be more generally active across your days. And that's a good recommendation for all people is to break up their sitting more frequently and be active across the days. The step count doesn't need to be 10,000 steps, but just like moving more generally. So that's one thing that might be potentially happening where you don't even recognize that you're moving less or you're less active. And the next thing is is that, you know, you do have this, that, that shifting of fat. And I know that's really hard for people, but you might end up having these shifts in your hunger and satiety and perception. And so there, there's this really cool study that I did mention in that post that I thought was a really interesting reframe of this idea of like, you, you have this, you're like, you're more, you're have decreased 
anabolic sensitivity. So essentially you're less prone to building and recovering muscle tissue, or you're not using protein necessarily as, efficient, as efficiently. And what happens though, you might also be on, the, on simultaneously while this is happening is under eating protein. And so along with that, you might end up having this increased hunger to fill that protein need because your body needs more protein to meet the, the demands of what your body is asking for. But then because of our hyper palatable food environment, you might be, be indirectly eating to hunger and satiety with all of these carbs and fat foods, but not getting in that protein intake that you need. We also know that protein in general, like moderate to high protein diets really help regulate satiety. And they also help with body composition and they also are going to help with muscle building recovery. And so that protein intake in that peri and postmenopausal period becomes more important. It's not that it wasn't important before. It's that same thing. Margin of error is smaller. Like these things that were important become the, the importance of them becomes magnified. Have you seen Steven Simpson and David Robenheimer, their protein leverage hypothesis? Yeah, this is essentially this. Right. Yes. So yes, like the yeah. body, then my understanding is our body is very sophisticated and mm -hmm. it's kind of sensing these different nutrients. Yeah. There's a desire or appetite for protein. Mm -hmm. And it's a, that's a very strong appetite. Yeah. And what you're saying is if you're surrounding yourself with these hyperpalatable foods that are protein dilute, mm -hmm. there are a lot of calories. Yes. Your body the, the the message that your body is getting is essentially it's not enough protein here. Keep eating these. Yes. You'll overeat calories in order to you try, try to, to get yes. to a certain amount mm -hmm. of protein. So, but you're that hungry, so you feel okay. Well, I'm eating to my to my hunger level, but you're eating all the things that aren't meeting that. It's exactly that. It's that protein, essentially that protein leverage theory, and why that's more important because you also have this this increased need for protein, or you're less sensitive. To, you you just it's it becomes more important because of that decline in estrogen. And so I think that you drive up that protein intake in the meals and foods. It's great for muscle health, and it's also great for managing that satiety. But then because of that decreased sensitivity to protein, and you're more catabolic, you're you're breaking, you're more in a state of breaking down or not necessarily promoting muscle tissue growth, then you're decreasing or losing muscle tissue mass, which in turn decreases your metabolic rate. You become less metabolically sensitive. You're less insulin sensitive. You have less glucose disposal. Um, you're potentially producing less energy when you are being active, and then you're burning less calories, and you're also becoming less metabolically inefficient at the same time. Like Then that's kind of that insulin sense. Uh, insulin insensitivity and, you know, metabolic disease and going down that pathway of things. And so muscle is a large contributor to resting energy expenditure. And so you kind of have this dynamic of like you're moving less and you're not eating enough protein and you're losing muscle. So then you're not only gaining weight in your midsection, but you're also decomping. Your body composition is moving in a negative way where you're losing muscle and you're gaining or shifting fat centrally. And then I think a lot of, you know, females feel so frustrated because they're like, I didn't change anything. But sometimes it might be the fact that you didn't change anything might be causing that because you might have gotten away with more of those things pre-menopausal, but that margin for error is how I like to say it is, is, is smaller. So you almost have to be, and I don't want people to become like restrictive and obsession. That's never my message, but you might just have to be more dialed in on the things that you're doing. And also keep in mind that there's also the factor that Sleep is potentially negatively impacted with menopause, hot sweats, um, waking up in the middle of the night, things like that. Interrupted sleep from pets and children. I mean, most you know women during this phase of life have usually older children, and they still might be interrupting their sleep and things like this. But you know, you have potentially impacted sleep or poor sleep, or the quality becomes lower even at the same duration, and even in poor sleep itself impacts recovery and muscle recovery and. And, and it increases your hunger drive to eat more. And then you're, you, you're not as energized to burn as much activity or move more. And then it kind of feeds into that loop of all these other things that are also happening in the body at the same time while that is happening. And so I think the other component of this too is that there's a lot of lifestyle factors that we see independent of menopause that happen with aging. People move less. They're less active. They have more responsibilities. They have more stress you know, maybe they're drinking more casually across the week and having these other lifestyle factors or behaviors that are factoring in, or they're just less strict or diligent or healthy within their diets, or they never, you know, I think there's a lot of people who they just, they, they stop being active at a certain point in their twenties and thirties, and they don't really worry about what they eat. And then when you get to that shift in your transition of your hormones, it catches up 
a little bit more, like that, that magnitude of that catches up a little bit more. I also think society culture is changing a lot. So mm-hmm. <laughs> the women that are in menopause now grew up in a very different time. And you know, yes. there would have been much less women in the gyms doing yes. resistance training. Mm-hmm. So that stimulus is a lot more foreign to mm-hmm. this sort of part of the population. Yeah. And perhaps in 20, 30 years, we see a little bit of a different picture mm-hmm. with you know women who are now in their 20s or 30s yeah. but are embracing resistance training. Yeah. Um, so I have to imagine that that resistance training piece for women who are currently in menopause is a little bit of a, a barrier. And yeah. there's probably a lot of women who are 50 or 60 and doing no resistance mm-hmm. training. Yeah, no, I mean, I can only hope in my lifetime. I mean, we've seen such an increased spike in interest in resistance training and good training in in females, largely driven by the drive of booty gains, honestly, which I will let that, (laughs) let that be the driver motivator. But I think that's why there's this confusion and frustration is because like, and especially this trendiness, just like the cycle training of menopause specific workout programs, because for many of these, these women, they never, they maybe ran or did cardio or walked, but they never did resistance training. So I will say for those of you who are listening, I think a lot of people, when I talk about, you know, training for, for women, they'll be like, well, does this count for menopause too? So everything I talked about resistance training earlier for you guys, it also applies to you. The same thing applies to you. Um, train with the intention of gaining muscle strength will come along with that. Um, I think that's the most important thing is to give yourself that stimulus or try to, to gain or preserve as much muscle as you can when you're in that phase of life. And, it's not too late. I think that's the message they also need to be hearing is it's not it's not too late to start at any point in time. Um, but the other things when I think about that too that they don't do, which a lot of a lot of women don't do that have don't have a history of sports, plyometrics, that power training and that effort training. I think I think everyone should do a little bit of athleticism type stuff in their training, but like the two most important things for that transition, if you're not doing them, is to start doing them is is resistance training, heavy resistance training, and some sort of jump training. It doesn't need to be like, you don't need to go be doing triple box jumps. You can be doing s- skips or pogo hops or single leg hops or like little things like that to start and then progress into more things um, further on. But it's it's you need to start training intentionally with the idea of stressing and stimulating and preserving the power output of your muscles. You get the you get the bone mineral density benefits as and the, well. Yes, that too. Yeah, that that when we think about muscle, that's what we want to be preserving. But that's that's like one of the most important things too. And so you know, bone mineral density peaks really early on in, in a female's lifespan. That's also why like eating enough for teen athletes or girls in their twenties and not being under eating is really important because you, you that is when you're like really maximizing that and that's build up the savings. You build up the savings of that, but that isn't to say. I mean, there is data in you know midlife women. That shows that doing plyometrics and or resistance training, it either potentially increases that or at least preserves it. What's plyometrics if someone's hearing that? Yes. So plyometrics are jump. It's jumping training. Um, So plyometrics are really important for bone mineral density and in power output of muscles. But like the the combination of the plyometrics with the the strength training seems to be like the most ideal for bone mineral density, at least maintaining it or you know, potentially increasing it. And so it's, it's just jump training. So it's essentially short, rapid jumping cycles of like max output when you do a few reps. So maybe like something like three to 10 reps of something, and then you fully rest and recover. So it's things that are any sort of jumping, bounding, or leaping, and they scale from like lower intensity, moderate intensity, higher intensity. And so for most people listening to this, don't just start by doing like depth drops or high like rebound burpee broad jumps like start with skipping or double leg pogo hopping or you know like low box jumping and then move to something like maybe like lunge jumping or squat jumping or then maybe depth drops and high box jumps but like it doesn't even need to be like some of these programs are like just like people just hopping for like five sets of 10 every day or a few times a week. And that's what like some of these interventions were. And so that with the resistance training appears to be the most, one of the most beneficial combinations of training for, and again, I think that if, if more females did that across their entire lifespan, they'd be better off. But if you haven't done it and you're at that peri or postmenopause transition, it's not even that it's menopause unique specific training. It's just like, these are the tools of training that are highly effective in many people, but that become more important or shown to like help preserve the things that you are losing um, within that. Yeah, that 
this is interesting because it's kind of like building on a, another conversation I had with an exercise physiologist from Australia, mm-hmm. Justin Keogh. Yeah. And he was talking a lot about the importance of power mm-hmm. as people age mm-hmm. and power reduction. And if I recall correctly, I'm fairly sure he said that at least early on in the development of sarcopenia, it tends to be more of the fast twitch muscle fibers that are lost. Yeah. And you already spoke earlier to the sex differences Mm -hmm. in that women tend to have more slow twitch muscle fibers and less of the fast twitch to begin with. Right. So I would, I would, I would think when it comes to sarcopenia and aging, if power is important, it's even more important for women who are already starting from this position of having less of those fast twitch muscle fibers to begin with. Yeah. So one of the really beneficial things for, especially, you know, when we think about peri and postmenopause is the inclusion. And we have a like a good bit of data on high intensity and sprint interval training as like cardio modalities because that's high power output, type two muscle fiber, fast, like twitch driven type training. And so is plyometrics. And so is strength training. You're really targeting and developing those those type 2 muscle fibers. Um, And so we want to be making sure that we're either developing them or preserving them at all costs. And that's really important. I think it's like, like, I think think most people like just stop sprinting or jumping or doing these high explosive things as they age. But if you keep doing them, you will maintain and preserve that. You might not be as powerful and fast as you were in your 20s, but it's really, really important for health and aging, I think, to keep doing these higher power output things. But yeah. So one of the things is that when it comes, this is like a potential sex difference thing is that, you know, I talked about earlier in the premenopausal state, you know, females might be able to recover faster between bouts of high intensity interval training. They might need less rest training. Like that's a good example there. But I think the inclusion of high intensity interval training across the lifespan is something worth doing to develop that. You know, a lot of people like to toss around the 80-20 rule of like 80% low intensity training, 20% high intensity training. I'm more of the like, well, how much training are you doing? And then let's figure out the split of it. But it might be, you know, that might be something that we do see is like, okay, well, maybe females need like a slightly more increased favorability of that higher intensity stuff because they lack that characteristic or that development or the training of it or to preserve that with that. So, you know, menopausal, if you're going through perimenopause or you're postmenopausal and you're only doing like two sessions of cardio a week, I'd like to see those be like high intensity interval training or sprint interval training and then fill the rest of your time with whatever activities that you like. I really like that. And that's not to say though that like the zone two or the easy training is not beneficial or is harmful or is like, spiking your cortisol and, and contributing to your menopause belly or any of that stuff. It's, it is, but I'd like to see that again, it comes back to that, that quality of that, but training to keep and preserve that. And there's data too, with the, with the high intensity interval training that it, it helps, you know, improve body composition associated with menopause. Um, that's not to say other cardio doesn't. I think that the, just a lot of those studies are looking at that. And interesting, my friends, um, Abby Smith, Ryan and Sam Moore, Sam is one of my good friends and Hannah, um, they just published a thing out of Abby's lab and you can see she's a fantastic researcher. And I, they just found that like baseline adiposity and high intensity exercise minutes were related to menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms and like potential, like essentially like the, the lower the adiposity or the more high intensity minutes, some of those symptoms were reduced associated with that. And so I think we might see more of this too. Right now, the literature is not, it's not like, hey, if you exercise more, your menopause symptoms will be completely eradicated. We don't, we don't, we can't say that. We don't really have the data that suggests that. But I do think that it, it will strongly help reduce a lot of those negative health effects or body composition changes that we have with that. And so you might still deal with the other symptoms of that. But when we think about the metabolic symptoms of it, it's going to play a really important and strong role in maintaining that. And I think the, the greatest mindset shift I've seen with those mid, mid-age women that I talk to a lot is that they really are training. They shift from training to be thin to training for life and training for aging and longevity. And I think even if you have that frustration with your changes in your body composition, you know, shifting that mindset to that and then, you know, making sure your diet and nutrition are complementing that is where you're probably going to see some of the, those changes actually start, start to come. Um, but you just need to shift that priority to thinking of like building rather than losing, which we take a lot of that from that. Like that's like, oh, I extreme dieted my whole way up until 45 and I hit perimenopause and it didn't work anymore. And we're like, well, you just can't extreme diet your way through your, for through eight decades of life. Like at, at some point, something's going to have to give and you're going to have to adjust something somewhere. Um, but I think that shift of like, hey, I need to build muscle and resiliency in that mid-age period is really powerful and really, really important. 
just to kind of underscore something that you said. Mm-hmm. Because there is this idea on social media, at least in some circles, that women don't need zone two. Yes. So what you're saying is you would like someone to prioritize HIT if they don't have a lot of time for cardio, mm-hmm. but you're not saying that women should completely disregard zone two. So there's benefit to training at these different intensities, yes. steady state and then a, a higher intensity. Yes. And then I'll get you to kind of expand on that. Mm-hmm. And then I want to come back earlier. You said true HIT. So yes. I think, there's I, think diff- I needed to find that. A, I know. There's a, a few different ideas of what HIT training mm-hmm. is. So perhaps we first yeah. double click on zone two. Yes. So I think a better way of phrasing this is not that women don't need zone two or zone two is bad for us. It's that we need to be making sure that we're including and prioritizing and getting in high intensity or sprint interval training as well. That's important for us to get in, but it doesn't mean that zone two is bad. We also have data. I mean, this is like my bias because my dissertation essentially showed this that like, you know, and other things show this that you know, training status affects fat oxidation in females as well. It's not like you just wake up and you have this max fat capacity, you're super metabolically flexible, you're super healthy just because you were born with est- like estrogen being your predominant <laughs> cell signal with your hormones. It's There is a training stimulus to that. I actually, this is something I would love to research is like the interaction of exercise because there's estrogen receptors in the muscle and how that activates or, you know, potentiates or turns on, so to speak, these benefits and adaptations we get. Um, and so it's we. Ha- if you are a female, you have to do aerobic training to improve your fat oxidation and your aerobic capacity just like everyone else. You don't just wake up to that. But you kind of are a little bit better at using fat for fuel or being oxidative by, by nature, right? So that's where that comes into. But you still need that training stimulus to refine that or maximize that or develop that aerobic capacity. High intensity interval training and sprint interval training is fantastic, but you can only do so much of it at a high quality. And you don't need a ton of it to get some of the results and benefits. But what happens with high intensity training and easy training is they both work through different pathways to kind of stimulate that mitochondrial biogenesis and the improved utilization of lipid and glucose when we're at at rest and in response to meals or in general during exercise. And they work through two different mechanisms. So either high volume, low power output, high power output, low volume. And they work through these different mechanisms, but essentially you, you're limited on how much of this high intensity stuff that you can do and recover from in a, in a given week and do of high quality. And so what you can do though, to continue to drive aerobic adaptations is you can do a lot of volume of the easy stuff and move that and move that needle forward. And they they work similarly but different in how they stimulate these these pathways and refine them. And so you can't, I like I think with like the exercise guidelines as a minimum of what people should do, it's 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week or 75 minutes of vigorous. And it's essentially trading off two for one. And I think that's fine from a bare minimum health perspective, but I do not think a minute of high intensity exercise is the same as a minute of like easy exercise. I think that they are unique in what they each do. So I think if you walk three miles, it's not the same stimulus as if you run three miles, so to speak. I think that you're getting unique and different adaptations and you need the intensity. You want that high end effort stuff, but you just can't do a lot of it. So females might want or need or benefit more of that because they might need to develop the characteristics of their type two muscle fibers a little bit more because of those sexist differences. So it's potentially like, hey, maybe the distribution of what you're doing is shifted a little bit more for females so that you you can get more of that adaptation or that gain. But that's where weekly volume comes in to play, where zone two training for somebody who's starting to do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours a week or more of cardio is going to start to become a good bit of your cardio training. You can't just keep doing more and more hit sessions every single day. You're probably going to get in one to three high quality hit or sprint interval training sessions a week if you're only doing like maybe two or three days of cardio and you're sit- sitting in that like minimum exercise guideline range getting to like 75 minutes total. But as you start to increase that volume of what you're doing, that's when you're going to start to distribute that more to zone two. And that and, and, and women aren't not going to benefit from that. I mean, I'm biased, but I do a metric crap ton of zone two training. And I can tell you right now that my everything that's supposed to adapt when you adapt to training adapts. But even with like adding in a little bit of that high intensity stuff, a little goes a long way and you can get a lot of benefits from it. You just have to make sure you don't remove that entirely or you still keep that in your training or for the busy regular person who's not doing a ton of training, maybe they're doing two high intensity days a week and one easy day per week, or they're doing 
you know, their one to three high intensity days and then whatever general other activities that they love to do outside of the gym, outside of that, and just including that within their training program and not thinking it of as either or, but hey, this is something that I should do and I need, but the rest of that's okay too. I had a whole episode on zone two with Hineko San Milan. His uh, paper with George Brooks on metabolic flexibility and lactate actually was what inspired my dissertation study, actually. So um, I haven't listened to that episode, but I saw some of the clips. But yeah, he is uh, he actually works at CU in, yeah. in, in, in the endocrinology yeah. department. I've never overlapped with him, but his uh, his paper on metabolic flexibility actually like inspired my entire dissertation. So mm-hmm. yeah. Well, the, the cliff notes from yeah. that episode, at least from his perspective, I guess the shorthand way of knowing that you're in zone two, which could be helpful for someone, is... Uh, you're a bit puffy, you can still talk uh, a little bit, probably can breathe through your nose, but not everyone can. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he seemed to think that once you start to go sort of out of zone two, above zone two, it becomes much harder to to have a conversation. Yeah, it's because it's essentially marked at that ven- first ventilatory threshold. And so that's, that's like, like the talk test is one of the easy, because everyone gets so frustrated with the heart rate. And like a lot of that heart rate being low in zone two comes from that easy aerobic training, right? Like you still need that to kind of really get to that. But yeah, that talk test is super easy because it's like, like I ran, I ran yesterday and I talked to my brother the entire time on the phone and he's like, what are you doing right now? And I, I was like, I'm running. And he's like, I had no idea that you're running. And that's why I love telling people, I'm like, can you have a conversation? Like, can you talk to, like, I call my mom all the time and talk to her while I'm running. That's impressive because I, I know that running Take, throws a lot of people out of zone two. It does because it's – and that's – part of that comes to from like it is a little bit more excitatory for the central nervous system. I think zone two for a lot of people – I think honestly rec- harder recommendations for people who are listening to this, female or otherwise, if you don't like to run, one, it's a lot easier to stay in zone two um, on a bike or an erg or a rower. And same thing we'll define hit here in a second. It's a lot easier to do true hit on like an an erg or a machine that you're like locked into so you can go at that full power output. Because if like running's a skill and sprinting's a skill, like I think doing actual sprints of some degree are great to do. But running is a skill and like I don't think people should just like start sprinting on a run if they haven't been running at all because if you want to, you know, you want to develop the the adaptations to your connective tissue within that. But it's easier to get on a bike and push all out on that because it's a little bit more locked in and it's not as much skill demand as like a rower maybe or even a skier. And so I like the bike's a really good option for that because one, you stay in zone two easier or two, you can reach a higher power output or effort on the high intensity stuff with less like. You want the limiting, the limiting aspect is your cardiovascular system, not some type of mobility or skill issue. Yeah, like if you're not, I mean, but the same thing for like my, my running clients, they're like, wait a second, my speed work is basically high intensity interval training. I'm like, yeah, that's essentially, you're just you're just training specific and different energy systems to tolerate different speeds and intensities, but you're a runner, so you're practicing that, doing the thing that you're trying to do because you want, it's kind of like the, the, the skill of doing a high rep max lift effort. It's very neuromuscular and same with fast running. You have to practice that. But if you don't care about that, or you can't do that very well. Yeah, remove the limiter. Go like I think the bike is probably the 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 best piece of cardio equipment. And like if you can, even an air bike is great because that's just like a full body crusher for a lot of people, and that really spikes. Because running sometimes gives more of that cardiovascular stimulus too, because it is very whole body and very stressful versus like maybe like a, a seated bike. But like an air bike, I think is like one of like, probably the most evil, but best forms of like localized locked in easy to use cardio equipment for a lot of people and if you don't have that you use what you have available to you but yeah run us through a before we kind of land the plane here yeah this episode has actually turned into a marathon i know sorry i made an ultra marathon out of it i have a lot of knowledge very in this fitting. little tiny very, head. Very fitting. i know i turned it into an ultra sorry uh I need no some, i love more it carbs. i love it ask a question and just let you go yeah uh okay what is a true hit protocol what does that look like so if i'm going to do one or two hit sessions a week according to the evidence the way that we want to be doing that to get the best bang for our buck Mm -hmm. how are we approaching this yes and so people think hit is like your group fitness circuit class or high intensity boot camp type things and i'm at the point where like if the terminology that the lay public uses i'm like that's fine because that's what you recognize it as but when we think about like true hit and what we see in the evidence of what's beneficial or studied for these specific benefits we're looking at. We are looking at 
exercise training sessions, and I should also preface this, when I say HIT, I also mean the inclusion of sprint interval training, because sprint interval training is just a subset of high intensity interval training. Um, it's just a shorter form of it. So on the lower end of the spectrum of the more sprint interval training, you're looking at maybe four to six rounds of 20 to 30 second all out effort sprinting, like max power output as hard as you can. You're technically probably going at an effort higher than your VO2 max or your power output at VO2 max. You um, say sprinting, that can be on a bike, it could be, bike on a could rower, be running, running, it could be rowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just your max effort of what you can do. And then you're fully resting and recovering, probably at least 90 seconds, but maybe two to five minutes upwards of that. It's kind of like very similar to strength training in nature. You're doing this very short, high, like... 20 to 30 second, mm -hmm. all out burst. Yeah. 90 seconds to five minute rest. Yes. Repeating four to six rounds. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's... That's sprint training. Yeah. And that's when you're doing that, like your max your max effort, like you really need to recover because that's using a lot of phosphocreatine, just like lifting is, it's really depleting and it takes about two to five minutes to replenish the, the phosphocreatine system, which is why that kind of rests there. Um, and so you're, when you're doing those short intervals, you're really trying to like go all out. Like you should feel like you need, like you can't breathe when you're done because you're going to have this recovery response. Eight out of 10, through. nine out of 10, 10 out like, of 10. This is like nine to 10 out of 10 effort. Yeah. So the shorter the effort, the shorter the duration, the higher that effort and intensity is going to be. And then you get into more hit hit training, which is going to be maybe like one minute to four minutes on. And then the rest ratio is something like half to two times the duration of it. So some of my favorite hit protocols to be more specific is like, I love the one minute on, one minute off. I think that's that. You're starting at five rounds and building up to 10 for a lot of people, I think is a great, easy workout 10 to 20 minutes you're in and out you could also scale it or modify it for people who either want to go more intense in that one minute or potentially have lower fitness status and need more recovery and doing a minute and a half to two minute rest and that's a great thing if you're starting out and you are new to this or you have lower cardiovascular fitness do less rounds and more rest when you're doing these because that will be a little bit easier for you or just start with the easy cardio and then work your way up to this. Um, and then you could go up to like two three or four minute bouts and so those are going to start to be like the one minute might be like a seven to eight effort, maybe eight to nine, but you can't you can't go as intense, right, at the power output. So your power output is going to be slower at each of these. Right. Um, so your your effort, it's it's still going to feel overall the max effort that you can do for that one minute, but your relative intensity of what you can do at like general speed and effort is going to go down. And then you get like two, three, or four minutes, and then you're doing those resting for like two, three, or four minutes. And so my protocol I used in my dissertation was four minutes on, three minutes rest for four rounds. And that's really hard. It doesn't seem like it's anything special, but that's, you know, a little bit of harder, longer effort. So it's a little bit different of of the, the spectrum of that sprint training. What kind of RPE are you yeah. aiming for if you're doing that four minute interval? Probably like, I would say an eight. Yeah, I think I so. I you're actually you're think, up there, but you're not all out because if you're all out you have and to, you're truly all out, yes. you're only going to last twenty or thirty seconds. And this is my advice with the repeated interval training: is you're only as good as your as your your slowest interval. And so you don't want to think about going all out in the first round and then not being able to repeat it. When you do these, you want to think about being able to repeat that effort over and over. You might dissipate a little bit with time. That's perfectly normal. That might be, the first one might be your highest effort and then you might slowly lower a little bit, but you shouldn't be like going at, I don't know, like maybe you're on an air bike and you're at 350 watts in your first round, but then you can only maintain 150 for the rest four. You, you, wanna, you wanna be able to make it repeatable and so you can sustain and keep doing that effort across time. And if you can't keep sustaining it and you're trying to do tons and tons of rounds, well, maybe then you're pulling back. Like if you're doing two rounds of four minutes, and then you're doing that until you adapt and acclimate to that. And then you're potentially doing three and then and then four over the time um, within these. And so those are come some of the protocols that are kind of established in the literature or that people are using that I think are really great. But are they comparable or is, is is sprint interval interval training superior to the the four minute intervals or the one minute on, one minute off? Yeah. So I think there's like a big thing right now. I think maybe not in the the women shouldn't do zone two side of things, maybe the more bro biohacky side of things, or everyone's like only zone two or only zone five. Like they've polarized to the point where they're like zone three and four are useless. And I, I'm not of, of that opinion. Um, I do like a polarized 
pyramidal mix, I guess you would say, in how I approach my cardio training. So polarized training is where you only do, you do the bulk of your training in zone two, and then you do a small bit in zone four or five. And then pyramidal is where you do a good bit of your training in zone two, but you do a little bit in zone three, four, and five. Less in zone three, but you still use a little bit of that. And so I think what, when we think about what the duration of these are doing, they're all targeting you know, different areas of our lactate threshold or our, our heart rate response or percentages of our VO2 max. And they're also targeting different energy systems or contributions of that, um, as well as potentially that power output. So I think sprint interval training and HIT are unique and that they, you know, the sprint interval training offers a little bit more of that max power output and that it's a little bit, you know, neuromuscular in, in, in nature and you're, 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 you're training to sprint and go all out. And then with HIT, it's kind of like, for most people, if you're training at threshold or above threshold or whatever, it's it probably doesn't matter too much. It's more the fact that you're doing it that's eliciting these benefits. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, it's more like, okay, sports performance, what are we trying to target with the individuals and train? With my clients, like what I do, pretend, I give my clients four sprint or head interval trainings a month to do. So like one a week. And then they have other like types of cardio they can do on top of it if they're not running. And I usually like to do a mix and a distribution of like, okay, maybe this workout you're doing 20 to 30, 30 second efforts, but this one you're doing three to four minute efforts. And then maybe this day you're doing 10 minutes max calories and you're recovering and then maybe doing a few short sprints. Like you can mix and blend these. And, and I think it's important for people to train um, across the spectrum. I think there's benefit to kind of training across the durations of these spectrums. And usually my rule of thumb with people is like what you suck at maybe that's what you need to be doing more. Like I'm- What you dread. Yeah, like I'm <laughs> I'm a really good aerobic. Like I have a really good aerobic base, but like I am really, really struggle with like, like high glycolytic activity. Like I can't recover that lactate at a high level of effort. And so for me, I know that that's something that I really struggle with, with those durations. Like I can sprint really hard and I can run for hours, but that like one to four minute effort, I really struggle with. So I know like, okay, like that's underdeveloped on me. So I should lean into that more because that's harder for me. But if you're just training for general health, I mean, I usually tell my clients, I'm like, I don't care if you cherry pick the cardio workouts, just do them. Like they're all going to be doing something for you. Most people aren't fit enough. I usually, my, my favorite thing to say to people, like, you're not fit enough to worry about the details, but do a little bit of everything and you'll probably capture most of what you need or want across time. Um, but I do think when you think about it, putting it in the buckets of sprint interval training and the buckets of high intensity interval training is something that I think is good to maybe do one sprint effort a week or you do one head effort a week, or you're including some variation of both across time in your training. Beautiful. Clear. <laughs> Let's finish on supplements. Yes. What is your supplement stack? So my personal supplement stack is protein, creatine, fish oil. How much creatine? Three to five grams a day. I probably do about four. Five, five upsets my stomach. Four doesn't. So I do. I do like most of a scoop, and that's the thing for people. Is that is the amount of I mean, creatine can have GI distress. So I usually do three to five grams a day, any time of the day. Doesn't matter when you get it in. You just need to get it in. Be consistent. It's more about consistency with creatine, and when you get it in, more than anything else. Um, DHA, EPA from fish oil. Yes. I do eat a lot of fish, but I still, so I don't, I don't do the full dosage of it. I eat a lot of fish. So I, I know I get a lot of that for my diet. Um, and then I personally take magnesium and vitamin D. I know you partner with Inside Tracker. I've worked with them in the past. I had low magnesium and vitamin D and they work in synthesis with one another. So I personally take that. Um, and then protein as needed and then caffeine, but mostly from coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very big on test. Don't guess. Um, I do think that, you know, on the note of females within that too, creatine, it's safe, it's beneficial, it's awesome. I think people are worried it. that it will lead to water retention. Yeah. And that's actually been shown to not necessarily not be true, but it actually might help with, you know, because it pulls water into the muscle cell, that's where you're getting that water from. You know, again, that my friend Sam and Abby Smith Ryan's lab, they did a study where they looked at that water distribution across the month and it suggested that potentially some of it might be help be hydrating. And some of the issues that happen with the luteal phase is there might be issues with, um, you know, sweat rate or overheating or maintaining hydration, especially in hot and humid conditions or with endurance training. An electrolyte supplement has been suggested to work, but creatine might actually be something that helps with that, that too as well. But it's, it's safe to take. 
It's safe to take across the lifespan. I know people are worried about pregnancy and postpartum. I think that's more so of like a judgment call of your safety, your doctor, and using a third-party tested supplement if you're going to do it. I think the idea is that it's probably beneficial, but no one's willing to test on pregnant women because of IRB approval for that is very hard. Um, there's some uh, early research coming out. There was just a trial of menopausal women taking creatine, and it and it did appear to be beneficial, um, or at least not harmful. And I do think from the muscle development that that's a great supplement to be taking across the lifespan. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, I know there's a lot of hesitation with it, but it's water weight is in body fat. I think that's important to recognize, but it also doesn't appear to really be contributing to that that much unless you do a loading phase and you don't need to do a loading phase. Just take three to five grams every day. You don't need to take 20 grams every day for two weeks or whatever it is. Um, you can just take. Just be consistent. Just be consistent with it. And if you miss a day, just take it again. It builds over time. It's not like it, it drops down after one day. So just keep picking back up and you'll get more out of those training sessions. You'll have more power output. You'll be able to do more reps or more weight and you get more of that stimulus that we're looking for. And so that's like my my thing. And then the other thing I was going to add too is that there is some stuff that is coming out, you know, again, a lot of the female fist stuff is so early that I always feel like I have to have like 27 disclaimers of like, this isn't like super absolute, but like these are things that are suggested. And so there is some stuff that suggested that um, micronutrient status might fluctuate across the month. And there might be some more micronutrient deficiencies in that late luteal phase. So things like um, magnesium and zinc has been suggested that might help. And, you know, Magnesium might help with some of the PMS symptoms as well. And so that might be beneficial to take then. You know, there is a lot of struggles with deficiencies with females with calcium and iron, but that is something that you should test, not guess, because there's, you know, potentially risk with upper limits there or, you know, iron deficiency and excess iron can sometimes mimic their symptoms. So you don't want to just like start blindly taking things with more of those. Like magnesium, you're probably not going to reach an upper limit on to the point that it's worrisome. It doesn't really have that, but those, like, you don't want to necessarily just be taking those willy nilly. Um, and then there's some other stuff because of the inflammatory response of the luteal phase and some of that, that's what leads to a lot of PMS symptoms and or potentially might be impacting your performance. You know, things like fish oil, vitamin D, curcumin, um, and magnesium have been suggested as ways to potentially manage some of that training or impairments there with that. And then um, one of the new ones too, as well as like using tart cherry juice as something because it's slightly anti-inflammatory, but also helps with natural melatonin production and sleep might be impaired in that, in that luteal phase. And so that's like my quick supplement spiel of like tart other things. cherry juice yeah, to get better sleep. Yeah. It, Interesting. And that, menopause, that might be helpful too. That's like a new thing that's coming out is that it might help lower inflammation in a way that's like kind of like not to the extent of ice baths, but just like that, kind of like if you eat berries and they're antioxidants and stuff like that. But it's put, it's supposed to help increase natural melatonin, which might help you fall asleep easier and have better sleep. And that might help with the luteal phase if your sleep is impacted or even in, in menopause. And so that's something that's like more and more people are kind of like coming out about. So that's like my quick supplement spiel of like other things to potentially look into and or consider. Um, but also like I'm a big proponent of like test don't guess if like you're worried about something specifically, um, you know, talk to your doctor or work with a, a qualified professional to help you make sure that you're, you know, those micronutrients and filling in the gap things that might be more specific that you're getting what you actually need, like my magnesium vitamin D. <laughs> We've covered some territory. <laughs> we have, we have, I know. <laughs> are there any, are there any myths or anything related to female exercise that you really, really wanted to cover that we haven't? I think the biggest thing that I really just want to say is like, you are not fragile. I think that there's this idea that your hormones make you fragile or being a woman makes you fragile or your menstrual cycle makes you fragile and you're delicate and you can't handle intensity or volume or hard work or effort or training or, you know, being a badass in your fitness goals and your pursuits, but like you, you can, and you are resilient and you are capable but you need to, you know, follow a good training program and, and feed and support yourself through that to do those things. And I, I really think that's important to get that message out there that like your hormones don't make you weak and fragile or lesser than. And you don't, you know, I think sometimes we still get this, this comparison to males. Like, well, you're, you perform better at this time or this time because you're more like a male or you have testosterone or things like that. But like you perform well and you are capable because you are female period like that I think that's really important to take away because I think so much of that narrative of social media paints us like these delicate little fragile 
like ceramic plates that are going to crack and our hormones are going to be disrupted and destroyed at like any sway of the wrong behavior. And I think it leaves a lot of, you know, a lot of women so scared to do anything. Creates paralysis. Yeah. It, it, it makes them so afraid to do things in the gym. And I think it's important to remind you, like, especially even with like the hesitancy around injury more so I see in my female clients and trainees than like males. It's like, you, you are very capable. You are very resilient. You are very strong. And if you don't feel that way, you can get there with exercise. You are, you are capable of achieving whatever your view of your goal of exercise is, whether that's running ultra marathons or doing a powerlifting meet, or maybe that's just being more fit and capable for a long life that's healthy. Like you are capable of all those things and your, your hormones aren't as fragile as social media makes it thinks they are. And they're a lot less fragile or more resilient when you eat enough to support them. Like those are the two really big take homes. I know we spewed a lot of science at you guys today. Um, but I think that like in the muck mud of all of that stuff, they're still going to be like, okay, well, like, am I doing the right thing? And like, you, you're, you're not as, you're not as fragile as people are making you out to be. And you are capable of so many things and your body is very, 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 very capable. And I encourage you all to go do something that surprises you, changes your perception of yourself, or blows your own mind with fitness because it's an incredible, especially on International Women's Day, it's an incredible tool of self-empowerment and confidence and rewriting that narrative that we are just supposed to be here to lose fat and restrict our food until we die. Like there's just so much more to health and fitness than just that. And so those would be my like takeaways that are pulling out from that science lens of just like a woman who works with women and hears all of these narratives all day long and has really spent her career trying to rewrite what fitness means for people that are being influenced by me, I guess is the word to say, is that like you get to have more than just what you've been sold and you're st strong as hell too. <laughs> well, I appreciate all that you're doing. I love your passion. You. And that's a, that's a very reassuring and uplifting yeah. message to, to finish on. So thank you so much for yeah. bringing the passion today yeah. and for all of your research. And, and like I said at the, the top, the dedication that you have to communicating all of this in a very accessible way, yeah, something that's inspiring to me. I and appreciate I hope that. that. Thank you. You. <laughs> you keep doing it. Um, and I'd love to have you back on at some stage. Where can people find you if they want to learn more? Yeah. So I, I largely hang out on Instagram. Um, Docless Fitness is kind of what I go by. Um, D-O-C-L-Y-S-S -S, and then fitness. Uh, people, A lot of people call me Liss. Um, and then DocLessFitness.com. Uh, my, my YouTube is Docless Fitness. I have a podcast called The Messy Middle Podcast because if you haven't gathered from today's conversation, I really like to hang out in the land of nuance and, and not so much extremes. And then um, my training programs are called The List Method and they have their own Instagram as well. So Nuance. The, the key secret ingredient to a three and a half hour podcast. I, you know, we didn't think we were going <laughs> to talk that long, but I'm, I just, I'm, I'm a talker. So I, hopefully you guys, you know, take this in digestible pieces. But if there are segments of things that you want to learn more about further, I do have some other, I have a lot of information on my podcast and YouTube where you can deep dive into some of the cardio or menstrual cycle things a bit more. If you're like, you, after three hours, you still want you still want more. If you're still listening. <laughs> you're still listening to me at this point. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for it's having me. It's been great. Appreciate it. Thank you. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging with you again in the next episode.